Hello and welcome to Building the Premier Accounting Firm. This is a podcast dedicated to helping individuals have the premier accounting, bookkeeping, and tax business. Now, as we do this, we're helping you become confident and competent in the services that you offer to get you paid what you're worth. We're addressing such topics in each of these episodes that range from marketing and sales to onboarding, pricing. We're addressing issues that relate to client relations and so forth. Everything that you need to do in order to have the quality accounting services for your clients that you would expect to offer. Now with this, I'm Roger Connect, your host. I'm president of Universal Accounting Center. For more than 20 years, I've been working with accounting professionals to help them both start and build their businesses. I'm excited for the relationships I've built over the years and most importantly, the successes I've seen them achieve. Now, for today's episode, we happen to have an excellent guest. It's Richard Crayshaw. And Richard happens to be someone that you're going to find very exciting and interesting because of his excellent experience. Basically, Richard is a senior business executive with over 40 years of experience in general management, operational management, business transformation, project management, outsourcing, and organizational leadership. He has been a British officer in the Army, and as such, he is a management consultant, an IT executive, and a high school science teacher, and currently the chief commercial officer for a company, PBS, that we're going to be talking about shortly. He has worked on three continents, operating at country and sub-regional, regional and global levels, and in uh, both the private, private and public sectors. He's demonstrated a significant success in turnaround situations and transformation initiatives with an emphasis on effectiveness and efficiency. Colleagues would actually characterize him as an inspirational leader, ambitious but loyal, with a laser focus on results and adept at creating conditions for their individual and collective success. He has been honored for his skill in being able to rapidly structure problems, design solutions, and then implement them. He lives in Southwest Ontario in Canada with a second wife, Maria, and his three adult children from previous marriage. And with that, he is a keen daily runner who enjoys snow skiing and reading. Now, for his company, it is profitability. He accelerates performance by providing highly engaging, competitive, and unpredictable learning experiences which prepare people to solve real problems. We don't teach, or he doesn't teach, Uh, basically through case studies or anything. He doesn't use slideshows. Basically, he rapidly enables people to learn by doing. And I have to say, having experienced it, I agree. (laughs) It is exactly just that. So Richard, first of all, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you very much, Roger, and thank you for that for that glowing introduction. Well, you're welcome. Uh, the, the The thing is, is I think it's only appropriate, first of all, for your military service. Thank you for that. I think that's commendable and something that everyone needs to recognize. But living on three continents, that's something to be proud of. What three continents were those? Well, I've lived uh, in, uh, obviously, in Europe, and not just in the UK, but uh, in Germany. Um, and I spent some time in Cyprus. I've lived in Asia, in Singapore specifically, uh, and more latterly, of course, I'm on the North American continent where I have lived in Texas, in the States, and I'm now in Southwest Ontario. In fact, I was was working out, Roger. Um, My move to where I am now was my 45th move in my life. Oh, my heavens. So, um, yeah, I, I clearly... It's coming up to two years where I am now, and I'm I'm wondering if I'm getting itchy feet again. I hope not, because I really like where I am. Well, that's that's basically the question I want to ask. One, you're a nomad, so how long can you stay in any area? And you just answered that. Two years, and you've got the itch already. So what's the longest that you've stayed somewhere? I think the longest would be um, where we came from in the UK, um, which is up in the northwest of England. Um, I have a particular affinity. And it's uh, during that period where, um, as part of my portfolio career, I trained and became a high school teacher. Uh, One of the most um, interesting um, jobs I've ever done, actually, and probably the most satisfying, uh, truth be known. But yeah, I would say the northwest of England, specifically um, a place called Lytham St. Anne's, but very happy where I am now. So I may change that, Roger. You never know. Break, break the, uh, what, not tr- not necessarily tradition, but the uh, frequency of the moves, I guess. So you, you, you said s- the teaching was very gratifying. Uh, it was a science teacher. Why, why was it so gratifying for you? I think, uh, I think teaching, if I step back a little bit and just take teaching outside of 
um, uh, the high school environment and working with young people. Uh, but it's definitely the privilege of working with one with young people, which I particularly enjoyed. Um, teaching or uh, working with groups of people, regardless of whether you are formally an instructor, a teacher, whatever the word is, um, I think is a great opportunity to give back. I think it's a great opportunity to be of service. It's a great opportunity to make a difference. Um, and the real fun thing, and I'm sure if there are any high school teachers listening in, they will relate to this. An audience of young people, if you take the time and the effort to engage with them, will give you very tangible and palpable feedback. Um, they, they don't have the filters that perhaps they learn when they become adults uh, to be cautious about praise or indeed criticism. Um, and once you're once you've been exposed to that environment, and and it has its challenges, um, it is hard work. But once you're exposed to that environment where feedback is clear, uh, whether you're doing well or whether or not there's room for improvement, I found particularly gratifying and and very addictive. I do miss it to a certain extent. I'll be perfectly honest. Actually, I understand that I work with the youth in my neighborhood and. Working with them, uh, I wouldn't necessarily consider myself a teacher, probably more of a mentor. But the thing is, is it's very gratifying. I've had now the, the opportunity to work with some youth for over 10 years and to see them grow from these awkward young men into these men that uh, are now starting their, their own lives. It's incredible. The journey that's gone on and the relationship that I've built with them over the years is, is similar to what you're describing. So I, I can identify with that. So thank you. The question I want to ask now is you were in the Queen's Army, the, the, the British Army. What was maybe some of the takeaways that you have from that, that you feel have benefited you in your life? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I have reflected on my military career and uh, the biggest um, value judgment I come up against, especially when I first left um, active service, was um, a misunderstanding, I think, about how leadership works within the military environment. There is a, a belief that Everybody is an automaton and everybody um, is told exactly what to do, when to do it and how to do it. And I would argue quite the opposite. And I would argue as we, um, as we look around the world we're in now, where what I guess uh, my fellow veterans might call asymmetric warfare, um, the reality is that in the military, you now have to be incredibly adaptable. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to respond rapidly to a changing set of circumstances. And that's something which, as an army officer, that's a skill I learned and learned to hone, um, both on operations and indeed in preparing for operations. I had more flexibility, more opportunities, I guess, to fail, for want of a better word, than I've ever experienced outside of the military. So um, my takeaway from anybody um, who's done military service is that the, the real skill you learn is to be adaptable and flexible. And that's a skill set which will sit with you with whatever you undertake in the future. And that's my takeaway from my military service. Amazing. I, I one, am impressed by that, and two, completely agree. The I've not myself served, but I'm very much involved with a number of people that are veterans and uh, uh, find fascinating not only the opportunity to serve, but more importantly, the experiences they have. And it's interesting when I ask the question, what have they, what have they taken away from the experience having been in the service? The answer varies, but the ability to adapt very appropriate because it's ever changing. Uh, typically, they don't stay in any one area for more than three years. Their deployments are anywhere between six to eighteen months, and uh, it's just a lot of change. And so that's very, very true about adaptability. Uh, your colleagues, you, you um, are obviously known to being inspirational um, and loyal with a focus. What do you think that's referring to? I've always considered that. Whatever role you're in, in a leadership role, for sure, um, 
is my focus should be on the people who work for me. That doesn't mean that I'm not interested in what they do and how they do it. Um, of course, I'm interested in that. But what I really should be doing, and I guess this is when you move from leading a team to leading leaders, what you have to recognize very quickly is that your role is to create the conditions for them to be the best version of themselves. Roger, you talked about mentoring young people, and I'm sure you mentor other people, as do I. Um, but for me, I commit to making the situation for the people I work with the very best I can. And that may mean uh, doing counterintuitive things. That may be doing things which you might consider would be something I shouldn't be doing as a leader, but I would do it at an appropriate time for an individual because of their circumstances. I might go in and actually do work for them rather than the other way around. Uh, and I think that willingness to not consider my position based on hierarchy, but rather how I can best be engaged within the task or what the team is trying to do. If I'm not actively engaged in the doing of something, and I'm that's my it's my Achilles heel, Roger. I do like doing things. Then I'm trying to make sure that the folks that are doing the work, that they are in the best mental state and feel comfortable and confident and feel valued and supported. Uh -huh. So I'd like to think that that combination or that loyalty, really, that commitment to them, not just um, a tacit commitment, um, although actions do speak louder than words, but rather you know, telling them that I will help them, helping them, um, then I think that's particularly important as well. Maybe that's the inspirational bit. I'm also very enthusiastic. I, uh, I'm a glass half full kind of guy. And I love it, actually, when things start to go awry, when carefully laid plans begin to fall apart. <laughs> I think that's an opportunity for, and it's an opportunity uh, to show creativity and innovation. And it's back to that adaptability. There's something really satisfying about a plan going awry, fixing the plan, changing the plan, modifying the plan, and still reaching the goal. And doing that with your team and overcoming that kind of adversity, um, I think is terrific. So I don't know if I've answered your question. My loyalty, I think, is clear. Um, and I hope that the people I work with are inspired by my enthusiasm and my willingness to really play my part, but to try and make a difference on behalf of them. No, I, I think you spoke it well. The, the thing I would add to it is one of the things that I find important in leadership is the understanding that leadership is more servitude and it's trying to find what ways I can help those doing the actual work do it more easily or better. And what I mean by that is they're in the trenches. They're, they're trying to deal with the day-to-day -day activities. They're trying to figure out how to get their jobs done. And what I'm trying to do is have a perspective where I'm removed enough from the work that I can see the bigger picture and I can bring now tools and I can bring training and I can bring resources and maybe assistance to the people that are down in the trenches asking for different supplies and resources. So if I'm able to stand back far enough and see further than they can, if I can see around them their circumstances, I might be able to witness, see, or offer something that they're not aware of that could help them do their jobs better. And that's where I understand my role is most significant. So I break it down into three areas, tools, training, and temperament. Do they have the tools, the means to accomplish the task at hand that they've been assigned? Do they have the training that we've gotten to the point where hopefully there's a muscle memory to it? There's a second nature to it. Are they comfortable enough with the, what they're asked to do that they can do it, uh, not necessarily in their sleep, but hypothetically in their sleep? But the third is the temperament. And that's the hardest because that's the thing they have the most control over, which is their attitude. If they're in the right spirit, the frame of mind, if they feel that they have the support, if they feel that they've got the backup that they need to go all in and not worried about worry about what's going on around them, they're going to be focused to do so. And I'm going to throw a military theme to this. I think individuals that are at the front line are able to focus on what they're doing at hand on the on as an infantry 
simply because of the fact that they know that behind them, they've got the medics, the logistics, they've got the the um, the reconnaissance. All these things are behind them that if there's a need or a want, it will be met. And that's allowing them to focus on the task at hand. So li- literally in the military, there's as much as a one to 15 ratio of for every infantryman, a, a team of individuals behind them from logistics to supplies to support that's all meant to actually complement that one effort. So that that's a lot of information, but I think it complements well what you just shared. I do like the military analogy, and and I'm reminded you were talking about the three parts of leadership, and I'm I'm reminded, and I love the word servitude. By the way, I, I know that um, servant management or that that terminology has been around for a while now, but I was once told a real good test of how well you're doing as a leader is to take some holiday and nobody notice. (laughs) Uh, In other words, you go off for a week or two weeks holiday and the enterprise, the organization continues to run and uh, continues to deliver, continues to provide the service or the product that that organization does. And then when you return, um, you know, nobody's noticed. And I really, that that model has stuck with me. It does beg another question. Um, and uh, if if your calendar's full as the leader of an organization, I, I think that's probably counterintuitively not a good sign. I think as a leader, you almost have to have a free diary. You know, you have spare time. And if you don't, you should aspire to do that. I think Warren Buffett does this. I believe, you know, he has a couple of entries per week in his diary, which means he's always available. And in that role, which you've just described, uh, Roger, of being available, regardless of how you're going to provide that support to your team, you need to have free time to do that. If you're in back-to-back meetings, you know, how can you do that? How can you step out and provide that service? And, And last point, really, on the military thing, that infantryman who's in the trench or on the front line, um, he doesn't necessarily want the general in the same trench with him firing his own personal weapon. Um, um, Now, that doesn't mean there aren't occasions uh, where that is indeed necessary and would be done. But actually, um, they should be rare because the first thing the soldier is going to be thinking, well, if he's in this trench with me, who's, who's thinking about what we do in a in 12 hours time or a two days time or a week's time who's who's controlling what's going on um so yes he can pop in and say hi and uh, and and a lot of a lot of uh, military figures do that and it's very appropriate to do that but what they're not doing is necessarily you know trying to add their firepower if i can say that um to what's going on but again the caveat is there are some times where that's appropriate yeah. Well, at an at employment level, I'm willing to do whatever I've got any of my employees willing to do. There's not a call that they're taking. There's not a conversation they're having. There's not a task they're performing that I wouldn't be willing to give it my best shot. Now, I presume I've hired individuals that can do it far better than even I could. I presume with their training and with their repetition of doing it daily that they're better at it than I am. But at the end of the day, I'm hopefully not asking them to do anything I wouldn't want them to do as the business leader. But you're right. My role is totally different than theirs. And they need to trust that what I'm doing is more strategic, perhaps, and it's more long term in scope. And I'm trying to figure out how, how, we, how we can do what we're doing today differently tomorrow. And it's hopefully better, easier, and more profitable. And that's my job. If we're still doing the same job, a year or two from now, I may be failing as a leader because with technology and skills, things should be changing and improving. And so I need to be figuring out how to do this job better today in a year from now. That's a really, really uh, a good point. Last real real use of the military. The military understand there's strategic or uh, strategic aims and tactical aims. But they have another concept, which I really like, called the operational art. And what the operational art is as a leader is working out when do you need to be strategic and when do you need to be tactical. And and it's the ability to flex between those two 
extremes, if you will. I, I think that's probably the wrong word, but from those two um, scenarios and to move seamlessly from one to the other as appropriate, as dictated by the demands of your own organization, as dictated with what's happening in the market, as dictated what your competitors are doing. But um, able to step back and take that wider aperture and, and work out what needs to happen in the future, recognizing and having an eye on the now and then, just in case you have to swoop down and deal with a particular tactical issue. I love this concept of the operational art. I think from a business perspective, we do this. I just don't think we necessarily call it that. Yes. No, I like that. That was an excellent ex uh, explanation of all that. So I'm going to change gears on us, and I'd like to talk about profitability, uh, PBS. Yeah. Um, let, let's, first of all, have the understanding of what it is, and then I've got some specific questions. So tell us, you're the CFO of the company. What is the company? We are a training company. Um, and who specializes in uh, delivering experiential learning experiences. We're called Profitability Business Simulations. And there's a bit of a, a, a nomenclature um, issue there. Simulations, when we first started um, over 30 years ago, were really um, games, board games, actually, uh, was our business simulation. And through um, uh, careful design of the learning experience centered around the use of a board game in the classroom, um, we create very immersive and interactive um, scenarios, for want of a better word, but that's not really the right word. What our games do is they are models of client reality. And when you model anything, by definition, you're going to have to simplify it. And we do simplify um, how a business will create value, for example, because if we tried to replicate their reality, it would, it would take days, weeks, years to actually um, do anything with that particular model. So we do, as with any modeling, we do a little bit of simplification, but we add gamification into these um, experiences. And we're real fans of this experiential learning. And experiential learning is a kind of an active learning. Um, but it's not just learning by doing. That's a little bit too simple. We do a lot of learning by doing, especially when we're young. Most of us learn to ride a bike by learning by doing. We will put on a bike and then whoever was with us would, uh, if we didn't have any training wheels or we'd have training wheels to start with. That's classic learning by doing. What we do is we learn by reflecting on doing. And that's a really subtle and nuanced but important difference. So what we're looking for is we're looking for having a sort of concrete experience, which would then be followed by observation, either be from a third party or self-reflection on that experience. And then that would lead to a formation of abstract concepts, in other words, analysis of what you've reflected on, and then maybe draw some conclusions about your experiences. And then we'd move from that abstract conceptualization to something we call active experimentation, where you um, test your new hypothesis in a repeat of the environment that you were in. Now, you go round that virtuous circle or cycle, the experiential learning cycle, in our games or simulations, three or four times, depending on the, the nature of the game. And what you do, of course, is that it's a safe environment because it's a model of your reality, perhaps. And that gives you a chance to actively experiment with doing things slightly differently. Um, if you are somebody who is risk averse for, for good reason, okay, if you're starting out with your business Obviously, there'll be concerns and, and worries and the risk associated with that. Well, we try to create environments which are safe enough that people try something different and then see what the result is. Now, it can't just be some sort of sandbox. I mean, it really has to be relatable. And that's our forte. Our forte is that our games or our simulations, we do make them relatable to a client or an industry's reality. 
as evidenced by we've got over 500 games um, of different sorts, which some are incredibly bespoke and unique to not an industry, but an actual organization. And some of them sit in the broader category of an industry, and some of them are portable across multiple industries. So what we do is we design these highly immersive and engaging experiential learning experiences. We then build the games, whether they be uh, kinesthetic classroom games, i.e. a board game, or as we've um, as we're now engaged in a digital transformation, we have experiences which we run virtually. And we create and build those games. And then with our clients, we deliver the experience. Initially, we probably work and co-facilitate with our clients. But our business model is we want our clients to be running these um, games and simulations for themselves. Um, we're real fans of, of self-sufficiency. Because we, we want organizations to understand, Roger, that experiential learning we think is the best way to learn. As David Kolb, who's the kind of experiential learning guru, as he said, learning is the process whereby knowledge is created through the transformation of experience. And that really sums up, I think, what we're trying to do. We want our learning experiences to do exactly that. We want people to learn, gain knowledge, um, through the transformation of their experience. And there's one last factor I'd also like to add because I think it does differentiate us a little bit. There is a real temptation to look at a particular business function or a particular skill set, diversity and inclusion, um, public speaking, uh, whatever it happens to be. And we do training in that and then we practice that. But the reality is that in our businesses, in our day-to-day -day lives, we are using all of our skills at the same time. We're using some at the fore and some perhaps which are not at the front. But you rarely just apply one particular skill set. And what our experiences do, Roger, is they, they give you a chance to learn things, but holistically, when you're dealing with everything else that happens in your business life. So you're not just thinking about one thing. You're thinking about that one thing in amongst all the other things which you have to think about in your normal reality. Yeah. Well, the thing that I like about what you're doing, and, and, and I'm going to complement it with what we do here at Universal Accounting Center, is obviously as a post-secondary school, we're in the process of offering courses and programs wherein somebody's learning a principle. They're taught a concept. And it's very much... A, a, an experience as you would expect. You're learning something from the context of this is the definition of what a debit, a credit, uh, a financial report is, and so forth. And so you're learning the, the technical sides of things, but there's a practical side as well. So once you've actually learned the concepts, what we want to do is then as a school is put you in a position where you've now kind of mastered or understood their application but there's a last element that I think what you're bringing to the table is the experience of that principle that can do two things. One, it can further cement the learning. All of a sudden, it's now practical. I understand, oh my heavens, this is where it applies and, and where it actually makes a difference. That's huge because so often in life, I think we can learn a lot of things like we do when we go to, let's say, back in junior high or high school, you learn calculus, trigonometry, and Everybody that's uh, got children is always asking the same questions we asked when we were younger, which is, why am I learning this? I'm never going to use this. Well, there is this reality of, well, actually, there are a lot of places you'll learn such things as algebra and geometry. And at the time, you're just looking at these quadrants and so forth, wondering where in the world is this applicable in everyday life? And it actually is. And what we're trying to do now is put them in a position where they can experience this. Well, when it comes to business, it's hard to replicate some of the decisions that a business owner has to make, some of the complex decisions related to payroll that relate, relate to inventory or product development. There's a lot of nuances that we can give lip service to. We can say these are things you need to think about, but until you can experience them, it's hard. Well, it's, it's, 
one thing to experience them in real life because you actually own a business and you technically have to make this decision, but you provide an environment where these decisions can now be experienced in a game type experience, a, a simulator as you described it. And what I love that's fascinating about what you're describing is I'm now able to take the technical, the practical, put it into an experimental simulator of sorts in a team environment, go through some real world type situations and see the consequences of the decisions in a capitalistic situation. Situation. Here's what happens in business. And here how, here's how the market impacts my little company, if you will, and how I'm benefiting. So my experience, having gone through one of these, these uh, uh, simulations, I'll say, is a great deal of learning because I'm able to take what I conceptually understand. It's what I know, but now I get to feel it. It's at a very emotional level with my teammate as we're making decisions about what strategy we're going to implement in this gameplay situation. And the beauty of what I experienced was the role play. Having somebody facilitate it, they can kind of create this, uh, this environment that's fun and exciting. It's, a, it's like a new world. And I, I make it akin to if you've gone to those murder mystery type uh, activity, uh, it's a dinner where somebody puts on this thing where everybody role plays certain parts and there's this murder mystery of somebody in the, in the group is playing their part of an of a, of a, uh, investigator and so forth. Or maybe it's like, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and you've got the dungeon master and they create the environment in which you play the the roles that you're doing. Those role-playing experiences can be fun and they can be an escape. But in this case, they're a practical demonstration of business principles in a very real way. So I like what your business does. I, I've had some good experience with it. So here's a question for you. How does the business owner, the accountant, take what they've experienced with you and then now use it in real life. I'm going to start with the um your 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 reflection point earlier about um setting the scene. I think I think the facilitator and the participant um actually both um uh, own that responsibility. And I I think the competitive element of the game um allows both sides of that um equation if you will to get engaged. What's also particularly interesting for me is that when you're learning about pricing, okay, you can use a spreadsheet and you can demonstrate how if you can increase price by 10% versus decrease cost by 10%, um, you're going to do better. Now, you understand that. That's numerical. It's logical. And you would absolutely learn that. Fast forward, you're now into the third round of our um, visible value game, um, you are suddenly faced with some kept competitors. You don't really know what they're doing. You won no business the round before. Suddenly, your view of pricing is now being tempered by your emotions. Because as you know, Roger, we make important decisions when we are in an emotional state. And I think that when we make those kind of decisions, we then see a result. For example, I'll give you a, a, an example of a team that forgot to um, implement their investment strategy. They had come up with a really good investment strategy. They failed to buy the machine they needed. So they couldn't produce the product that they thought they were going to produce, but they still spent money on bidding in that market <laughs> with no inventory at all. And uh, so when we went through the results of that particular round, there was a sudden epiphany, if you will, where they said, we didn't buy the machine. And they couldn't stop talking about how that lesson, albeit highly unlikely, has now a context, context sorry, that they're unlikely to forget. Because here's the thing with learning. We learn something, and how often do we relearn it? How often do we find ourselves where somebody says, oh, by the way, you know, you might try this, and you think, I know that. I absolutely know. Why have I forgotten to do that? And there are reasons why you've forgotten to do it, but mainly perhaps the way you learned it or the context is not something that's easy to recall. 
in our games, uh, we have had people who have come up 10, 15 years, and they will tell you what happened in the third round of the game they played and the particular lesson they learned, whether it be of inventory, investment, whether or not they forgot about cash flow, whether or not they recognized that they were way too, too much of a bias in predicting success. They remember it. They remember it clearly. So to answer your question, I think um, business owners are learning th new things and relearning things they already know. What tends to happen in our game is if you do find yourselves learning something or find yourself perhaps relearning something, that the context and uh, the memorability of it, the fact you will remember it, means that when you go back into business and perhaps faced with a similar situation, you will be able to recall that learning and apply it into your business. I think that's when learning, that's really when the rubber hits the road. Does your learning, is your learning available at the moment when you need to apply it? Uh, and I would like to suggest that we try and create experiences that people take that away. And it will be different for different people. And that's the other joy about this. In a one particular environment, three people will experience the same thing and they'll take three different learning experiences away. That's an incredible force multiplier from one experience. Well, I'm going to share with you just three little things that I can testify of just because I witnessed them. One, I had my uh, our accountant, our controller go through the the experience with us. And her first thing was, I feel like I'm at work. I feel like I'm working. And it quickly then turned into gameplay. And I share that for two reasons. One, how close it is to actually the accounting processes that exist in business. It, it, it's that mindset as you're initially beginning. But then as it becomes more competitive, there is this intuitiveness that steps in and the whole experience becomes fun because of the interactions with your teammates. And at the same time, you get to explore different strategies and see the outcomes of what those are. And when you're in a game environment, she was able to see, okay, this is, this is the consequence of the decision we took based on the economic uh, or the marketplace situation. So I, I think she came from that experience better appreciating what some of her peers are doing, such as the marketing manager and the product fulfillment manager, all of a sudden she had a greater appreciation of their roles and their frustrations. The second person happens to be another individual that became extremely competitive. It, it tapped into within her this competitive nature, and she was just all in. And one of the things that I really appreciated about her was just the passion that she brought to the game. It's fun to actually go through this experience and not just experience a training, a classroom experience, but literally the game side of it. And at the end of the day, she was all in. We're going to do this come heck or high water. And it was just fun to play with her. But the third individual were the ahas. Um, I had a few individuals that in, in going through the simulation finally saw the application of some of the principles that they were learning, but they didn't really see how they applied in the classroom. They were concepts. They were like you were describing, just you know, a pricing exercise that you did in an Excel spreadsheet. And conceptually, it made sense, but there was just no emotional connection to it. But when you're making decisions and you see how the marketplace rewards those, those uh, decisions you're making, you're able to now see a practical application. And where I take all of this is then as accounting professionals, I think this really gives us an insight to the business owners, their mindset as we're working with them. We bring them their financials. On paper, a lot of times it just makes sense. It's black and white. This is what's happening in your business. And I think sometimes we need to be reminded that there's an emotional side to the business and running it. And this is something as a simulation that brings that to the forefront so that we can better communicate with our business clients and help them as business owners. My advice is not only for an accountant to go through this and experience this, this class, but to invite their business owner clients to do the same and hopefully be on the same team so that collaboratively you can interact with one another in making these decisions in a 
in a game environment and then later be able to reflect on this as you work with them in the real world as you have them as a client and you work with them in their business situation. So I think it has a very practical application. Do you have any final thoughts on that or any, anything more you'd like to add? Well, just to reinforce um, your point about breaking down silos um, and the experience, one of the experiences you described there of your controller, um, I can think of uh, a particular, we delivered this game for a client in Morocco and um, I put the head of finance and the head of sales in the same team. And let me tell you, um, two more different people as far as accounting and business is concerned, you could not have imagined. And most of the time when I dropped into their particular team breakout room, there was passionate discussions about risk appetite and pricing high and pricing low. And it was, it was real fun, actually. But it was done in, in the right spirit. But there were strong views. Anyway, we, we completed um, the session. They did a full, the full eight hours with a, with a break for, for lunch. And when I was just doing the wrap-up, I, I said to the two of them, is, is there anything you guys would care to share uh, from your experience? And, and the, the head of sales said, do you know what? I mean, I've let, the game was great fun and I really enjoyed it. But what I've really got to understand is how this guy, and he was pointing at the head of finance, I now get him. I understand why he speaks the way he does. And the head of finance stepped in and said, why we're doing this, why we're in this revelationary moment, I now get him. I understand now why he keeps doing the things that he does. And, and so they were just grateful that they were able to speed up. I have no doubt that given time, those two would have reached that understanding of each other what we managed to do was to accelerate um, um, that particular moment. And I think that's got to be a good thing. And that is not necessarily unique. The working, you may as an individual business owner, you know, uh, think about the fact that you run your business on your own and, and that's absolutely fine. That, you know, I'm not suggesting for a minute that that isn't right. But there's something to be said for being able to have a candid, open conversation with three other people in your team and hear what they think as well. You are multiplying your ability to consider different options and you're doing it in a safe environment. Nobody's writing down what you said you're going to do or what you actually did, but you will actually learn vicariously. There's a little bit of social learning in here you're going to find out something from another business owner which never occurred to you, which you really, really like. And you're going to grab that and you're going to put that into your own portfolio of skills or tools that you can use. Um, don't underestimate that as well. You will learn something about your understanding and your mastery of your accounting skills, but also you will pick other things up. So don't assume that it's only in the classroom and face-to-face -face, that these networking opportunities can give you these indirect benefits. In our games, we create the environment for that to happen in the teams. And, and it's a good thing. I highly recommend it. No, Roger, I think you've covered it particularly well. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed our discussion today. It was wonderful. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to wrap this up. And as I do, I'm going to come back to you for a final thought. So let me first of all begin with an amazing offer, and it's something that I would invite you as listeners to go to the episode description to get the details. Essentially what it is, is Richard and I have been discussing the Universal CFO Simulator using Visible Value as its platform. And this is an opportunity to go and actually participate in this experience. There you will find information about the actual training and the simulation so that you can understand better what it is. And more importantly, actually register to participate as well. There you will find a coupon. This coupon is meant to be for you as well as your business owner clients for you to actually all come in and experience this for yourselves. And most importantly, see business in a new light, open the lines of communication between you and your clients, and most importantly, see what lessons you can learn that can apply in your own businesses. This is an excellent opportunity to take and practically apply the principles that you've learned related to business, accounting, 
in a game light situation, a safe environment to try some strategic strategies, try some different approaches to business, and literally see the long-term effects of what those are. And at the end of the day, come away with, I think, a better understanding of business, understanding of your clients if you've interacted with them, and really improve the business communication that you have. So I invite you to go to the episode description and get the information you need to learn more about this experience and perhaps participate as well with the coupon that's provided there. Now, with that being said, as a summary, let me just start with, first of all, uh, Richard started with this this, um, uh, discussion of military. And honestly, I just think the world of those that take time out of their lives to offer service to their country, it's a sacrifice. It's something that I think is done for duty and honor. And more importantly, uh, we all benefit from it. So I appreciate that sacrifice. And there are definitely lessons that we can learn from that. And Richard shared some of his, basically from a leadership point of view, the adaptivity that we each need to have when we're put into, maybe even thrust into uh, unsuspecting circumstances. I think we need as business owners to have that adaptivity to really uh, kind of morph into the situations we're in and better from them. The other thing I think that was important is the leadership. We really recognize that whether as accountants where we're solo entrepreneurs or we have our own firms with accounting uh, professionals working for us, or maybe it's just our clients, we have to understand that there can be benefit applying the servitude mentality to literally come in and find out what tools, training, and temperaments are existing in our business and what we can do to enhance those to help them succeed in the various situations that they're working in. If we can come at our business relationships with that attitude, I think we can be much more influential in a positive way with what the with what people are doing. And then lastly, we spoke of this uh, this experience of taking all of the things that we've learned about business and about accounting and putting them in a simulator experience that we can actually now experience different workplace environments, different marketplace environments, different business strategies, and literally see how they play out in a game type experience. It's an excellent training, one that you'll definitely learn from and be able to apply not only in your business, but more importantly with your client relations. So I encourage you to, again, take advantage of that. So with that being said, Richard, what final thoughts might you have? I would say that if you've never never experienced an experiential learning experience or a simulation, or a game, um, I think I think you're going to be surprised, and I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised. It's not like a webinar. It's not like you've ever experienced for virtual learning. It is a fundamentally different experience, but it does come with a health warning. And that health warning is once you've played one of these games, you might be addicted. You might want to come back and play again. And you will learn something different if you were to play the game again. Every game happens or what happens in that game is created by those people who participate. And when you play the game, if you play it with different people, you're going to have different experiences and you're going to have different learning outcomes. If you attend one of these sessions I guarantee you're going to have some fun. Um, I hope you're going to learn something. And let's remember, we learn most things in our life in the first five years of our existence. And most of the time, our learning is through play. So let's not think that play is something which is just the bailiwick of children. We ought to be able to play and learn no matter how old we are. As I'm always reminded, um, growing old is mandatory, but growing up perhaps is optional. But this will appeal to your business nature and your profession, but it will also tap into the joy that you can have when you play a game. Well, with that being said, let's have fun. Let me just kind of end this up by saying, first of all, I hope you've enjoyed this episode and I encourage you to listen to our others. This is a podcast committed to helping you build the premier accounting firm. For that reason, definitely subscribe and get notifications as to when our episodes are released. We have weekly episodes coming out that address a variety of topics, listening to experts in the field 
that allow you to actually work on your business. So for that, just understand this. If it's about accounting, it's universal. So for more information about how you can apply these principles and others in your business, definitely visit us at universalaccounting.com or give us a phone call at 801-265-3777. And always remember this, accounting success is universal. Take care, be safe out there, and have a wonderful day. 